This is Do It For A Living, your source for inside information on the future of automotive performance. We could do affordable real-time telemetry for every racer using this kind of technology. And then that kind of segued into how we did our first crowdfunding campaign with the original version of Race Capture and in an external box that added real-time telemetry to that. What's holding you back from starting or growing your business into what it can be? Well, if you're listening to this, it's not a lack of information. What you're about to hear is all you need to get motivated and start making waves. Do It For A Living podcast details the journey of today's true players in their own words. Find out how they broke out so you can too. The time is now. The time is always now. Welcome back to another episode of Do It For A Living. I'm Todd Ersley with my shop assist, and today I've got with me Brent Picasso of Autosport Labs. Um, They've been around for a while making all sorts of electronic components, and uh, I've kind of been following their Facebook stuff because they've come out with some really cool things that I think are going to be beneficial for kind of the, I guess it's kind of a grassroots racer guy wanting to be a little more professional with the uh, live telemetry data. So we've had several people on the podcast that are doing the endurance racing stuff, you know, and it's, it's all just self-funded activities. So I think it, you know, that kind of data information to be able to send back at your WRL racing series, um, to back to the home pits for, you know, instructions on pitting or slowing down or any of that kind of stuff is really cool. So I've been following them for a while and really excited to have Brent on here to kind of tell us about, um, his company and what they've been building. So Brent, how are you doing today? Excellent. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, man. Again, I'm very excited to kind of hear your story. We have, you know, another one of these that we've never met in person, but we've been communicating back and forth trying to get this all set up. And so to get things started, you know, just kind of wanted to hear about yourself, you know, like, where did you grow up? What did you do as a kid? You know, lead us up to the point of starting Autosport Labs. Oh, yeah. That, yeah, that's interesting. Um, When I I was born in uh, Southern California, um, I'm the uh, first generation American. Uh, my parents immigrated to uh, to North America after World War II. That's kind of a long story there, but um, I they they moved to California and kind of landed there, and uh, I grew up there part of my childhood. And uh, that was really interesting because um, being a first generation American, I wasn't really immersed in uh, a lot of the uh, Americana culture, you know, football, sports, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I was really left to my own devices for exploring what was interesting to me. And I did spend a lot of time, like, building things and making things and playing with electronics. Uh, I had a hobby of, like, uh, taking things apart all the time and never putting them back together, but just just trying to figure out how things worked. Mm -hmm. I remember taking apart my sister's uh, record player with a hammer, you know, on the <laughs> on the back patio. Yeah, because yeah. that's the only tool I had, right? <laughs> I yeah. wasn't allowed to use any other tools. And then, and then later on, making really dangerous go karts, you know, with skateboard wheels, and taking apart my wagon and going down steep hills, and not really, you know, knowing how dangerous it actually was. But uh, yeah, that was a that was pretty. That was that was a great time growing up in California, in and that those formative years. Um, And then my parents moved up to the Pacific Northwest, um, just uh, west of Seattle uh, for the rest of my childhood. And um, it was, it was interesting because I was, I was moved from like a city to a rural area. And um, that was, it was kind of a shock for me because it was just very a uh, rural farming community. There wasn't much on um, in, in terms of the the kind of stuff that was interesting mm-hmm. to me, uh, technology, electronics, computers. But that's kind of when I kind of I got hooked into computers as well, and kind of combining the two parts of computers, uh, writing software, which was really really um, appealing to me I mean, as a kid, uh, playing with my early you know Apple II computer and like I. <laughs> And, so was this like um, was this like in the I guess it'd be like the mid '80s. Yeah, it was okay. in the mid '80s, and then um, the high school had this um, this big computer lab, and I ended up like basically running that, and the teacher really didn't know what to do, so I was pretty much 
uh, I kind of lorded over that, that <laughs> okay. whole environment and, you know, hacked it and just explored uh, just the whole world of uh, electronics and computers. And it was a little tough uh, being in a rural community because, like, the biggest thing going on uh, in, in our small town um, was, like, future farmers of America. And I just didn't, it just didn't turn my crank. <laughs> yeah. So to speak. So, um, yeah, I, after that, uh, I, my, my college studies were, was, uh, computer science, which seemed like the, seems the, like safest the right fit. Bet. Yeah. Yeah. It seemed like the right fit, um, uh, for a, a career path. And, um, and then shortly after that, I I met my wife and also co-founder of Autosport Labs. Um, much later on, of course, uh, and we moved to the Seattle area. Where okay, so uh, you did you I, stay in the Pacific Northwest to go to college? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, when we moved to Seattle, we just really needed to get out of that small town because. Um, you know, it's a great retirement community. It's beautiful uh, in a, on the, uh, what we call the Olympic Peninsula. But when we moved to Seattle, we knew that there were, there were going to be uh, many more opportunities there. Okay. So, Does she have a computer uh, science degree as well? No, she is in uh, – she has a background of medical, actually, when we're doing our day jobs, which we like to call our day jobs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> in, the, in the before time. Okay. Yeah. So what did you do right out of college? So you guys moved, you know, over to Seattle. Did you guys get, and you got jobs in your appropriate collegiate fields? No, it's kind of funny because as we were going to school and um, studying, we were, we were also, we we're just kind of doing some uh, office administrative jobs. And then um, my wife was working um, east of Seattle and she saw, she, she saw a, a job posting at Microsoft and it was kind of like an intern intern position there. And I was like, Oh God, you know, that's like a big leap. <laughs> yeah. And then it's, yeah, you know, we had just bought a house and we took this, uh, basically it was just like jumping into the deep end of the pool because this intern, this contract position at Microsoft was, was, um, you know, there's no guarantees. So I was like, well, whatever, you know, What's the worst that could happen? So I quit. I quit the. Um, I quit the stable job, and uh, took a job at Microsoft uh, for about nine months. And then right after that, I I took a job with. Uh, it was uh, GE actually GE Capital okay. with the, they had IT and uh, IT group and also software engineering group, and uh, that was pretty much the start of my my software engineering career. So it was, it was kind of, um, it was a big change, a big change for us in terms of, you know, stepping up professionally. Mm -hmm. Um, the interesting thing about working for a really big company like GE, I mean, you can't really, you can't pick a, a bigger company to, to kind of get lost in. Um, the, the kind of, the, the joke was, um, you know, like with, with my last name, I actually, when you look at the mailing list on, on GE's, uh, internal, you know, their, their, their Microsoft outlook, their, their mail search, mm -hmm. they're actually like 20 different Picassos working for GE around the world, which, okay. was, <laughs> yeah. which was crazy. So I really got the sense that I was working for this huge company and it, there was a, it was a tremendous, tremendous experience, tremendous opportunity. The manager I worked for, uh, opened a lot of doors for me to kind of propel my career going forward. But at the same time, I got this sense that if I didn't show up for a week or a month, it just wouldn't matter. For yeah, the you were, you were just a number and replaceable, huh? Yeah, it was. It just, it just really struck me uh, at that point. So, um, so then that's kind of where uh, my mind started going towards. Okay, yeah, I want to. I want to make a difference. At least in a you know a smaller company, a, little, a, little, a bit more of a thrill ride, right? You know, I, I want to. Mm -hmm. I want a stable income, but you know, I think I was thinking, okay, if my if I could just lean on my skills and marketability as a as an employee, then I could take a chance, work for a smaller company. So I started going into you know startup world after that, and worked at a number of startups. And um, what kind of what of time frame of, was that? Like what kind of what year was that that you were kind of making the transition? I was that was in the 
that was in the uh, kind of the early to mid 2000s. Okay, so it's quite a while ago. It was quite a while ago, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, around that time, we were doing um, autocross. Uh, uh, some friends introduced us into autocross, and uh, we thought, well, that's pretty cool. You know, like it was really, uh, autocross is really accessible because you don't need uh, um, a, a super prepared car, and uh, you just need a helmet and basically safe brakes. And the car doesn't, you know, the car shouldn't be leaking. You could do, you could do um, performance. Um, it's you're racing, right? Yeah, around yeah. around it's a bunch the of the easiest competitive thing you can do in a full size car. Yeah, it was super addictive and uh, super exciting to do, and it was the the great weekend sport. And we made a huge number of friends. And it was, you know, while you wait around for your autocross run, you're 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 socializing and having fun. So. Uh, that's what got us hooked into motorsports initially. So uh, we're kind of getting around to the uh, kind of the inception of Autosport Labs. But uh, so we uh, we had an Acura Integra that we were racing, and then um, sometime later I bought uh, my friend's uh, first gen Toyota MR2, and and I was thinking, oh yeah, of course, you know, we obviously need to modify this. <laughs> yeah. Right, and then it's the slippery slope after that. So we, <laughs> I, I got this. I got the bright idea of like, yeah, why don't we turbocharge this car? Because you know that would be fun, and a, a huge project. And uh, right around the time I was researching that, uh, I understood like you do you do engine modification, the the stock ECU you won't know what to do with the turbocharger. Right, it won't know how to fuel it. Uh, and nor will it be able to control ignition advance correctly. So uh, I was doing some research, and this was, you know, this was way back, but this was when around when the Mega Squirt engine management system could only do fuel, and then you had to have some sort of solution externally to do ignition advance. So um, on the Yahoo mailing list, it's probably still up there um, <laughs> yep. somewhere. But I was like, yeah, you know, I want to turbocharge my MR2. I want to use a Mega Squirt because I think it's cool. It's open source ish, and um, and I just I think that would be a better way of going, so I can learn instead of just buying an aftermarket ECU and just you know paying the money. Uh, plus, budget was a concern, so I thought, well, maybe I could take on building an ignition system. Okay. Kind of like in a, yeah, okay. uh, the mega sport system so uh the the mega jolt system was born um and what i did is i made this um really terribly designed circuit board wrote some initial firmware and uh i tested it on the car and then you know along with the mega squirt and it seemed to work okay was that like a nail biting and, experience that you were going to blow it up or was it kind of a safe thing to do Kind of, kind of nail biting because when you build something that you know that's actually controlling the engine, and you damage the engine based on some mistake you made, in, like in an electron, you know, the, in a circuit design or, or with the firmware. Yeah, I mean, like you do pre-ignition or something goes wrong, you're rebuilding an engine, and yeah. that's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot right? of work. Yeah. Right, and or if it leaves you stranded, you know, even you know, even better, and then you have to lean on AAA. Uh, AAA is awesome, by the way. So, um, yeah. I made that initial version, and then uh, I shared it on the Yahoo groups. I said, hey, um, I made this thing. Um, here's the information about it, and here's kind of how to make one. And, uh, you know, yeah, have at it if you if you want. So that was like a – I mean, it sounds like you piggybacked off the Mega Squirt naming and their actual system in, by making your Mega Jolt. Like... Yeah, I riffed, I riffed off the name uh -huh. uh, of Mega Squirt, so we, we said, hey, let's call it Mega Jolt. But actually, we called it Mega Jolt Light Junior, which is like violates two of the of the brand name like conventions you should do. You shouldn't call a product light, nor should you call it Junior. So I did like two of the full pods. You did both. It's Super Junior. Name. Yeah, right. Like super amateur uh, product marketing uh, going on, and uh, you know, I wasn't really thinking of the product marketing sense uh because we had no business at the time but so uh 
so I yeah so it was basically uh, there was two systems the mega mega sword did its own thing and then the mega jolt just controlled ignition advance so on the Yahoo groups I said oh hey I made this thing maybe you'd be interested but here's what I made let me, you know let me know what you think and then kind of one by one people you know raised their hands and said ah uh, hey that's kind of cool can I can I have one and I'm like well I I guess I can make a couple of them so. Mm. I literally like etched a, I etched three PCBs, you know, and ferric chloride, you know, like m literally made a, a PCB from scratch and and uh, sent uh, a circuit board and a programmed microcontroller, like a little, basically a computer processor, sent that to uh, a few people. I, I made an enclosure. I made some square holes in the end plates of the enclosure with, you know, with hand files and I, I you <laughs> okay. know, literally made square holes with files and everything and sent them to these people to, to test. And, and they're like, Oh, this is really cool. And, and it kind of fast forward. It was, it went from like, Hey, can you build me a few to, Hey, uh, can you, make a kit for me because, you know, I don't want to bother, you know, ordering all these electronic parts from. You just have to plug it in. Huh? Yeah. Parties. Right. Like I want, can you just send me a kit of all the parts and I can solder it together? And then, then it went from that to, Hey, you know, I'm not really good at soldering, but would you be able to just make one for me? You know, like solder it all together. And we said, Oh, okay. I guess we could do that. So, uh, you know, after after about a year, it's kind of hard to. It's kind of, it was a long time ago. You know, like several months to a year, we're up in our bonus room in our house. You know, the uh, my my wife and I are soldering uh, circuit boards. Uh, you know, the our, our our newborn is 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 in there too, and we're like rocking her <laughs> with yeah. her foot. Yeah. You know, like trying to solder and like trying to get organized with parts and the volumes going up and. And and I was thinking, holy crap! What are we gonna like? Literally, the the our 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 community or our customers or they're kind of synonymous, right? But like they're kind of pulling us into this business. Yeah, because um, did you still both have you know quote unquote real jobs at that time? Yeah, we had day jobs, so this was kind of like nights and weekends and everything. So um, so I thought like, wow, what can we what can we do to like uh, increase production. So I started researching, like there, there's, I know, I know that, uh, like the circuit boards are built automatically in a professional environment. So I looked at uh, contract manufacturing potentially, and that like to get the minimum, the minimums were really high to, to, to do something. And, you know, we really didn't have a, an idea of like how big, you know, ignition system admittedly is, is a pretty niche, uh, item. Yeah. Especially for in, one, it, one car, like one specialty right. car. Right. Like classic cars who had distributor ignition and, you know, go to crank fired ignition. And, um, so I started researching and found that, um, wow, I could probably buy some electronic assembly equipment, possibly fairly cheaply, maybe affordably. I, I, I spent a few months researching and I ran across an ad for, uh, a, a pick and place machine that, seemed promising but well you know was kind of uncertain as to like is it running what's the you know what's the uh what's the um you know the condition of it so i ended up um i bugged the guy so much who was selling the equipment he said fine just pay for shipping and if it works for you then you can pay me okay, so basically wow. so it's so so <laughs> I spent, you know, $500 shipping on a pallet, showed up at Estes Freightline, you know, at their depot, and it's this 1,300-pound, you know, four-foot by four-foot square piece of equipment uh, sitting on a pallet, and all I had was our race car trailer. And uh, I was like, they put the forklift on there, and then we, we bring it home, and I literally back the trailer in our garage, and... I'm like, holy, oh crap, how are we going to get this thing <laughs> off? off? There. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how are we going to get this thing off the trailer? And um, so we push, the t we push it back. <laughs> we like pulled it off the trailer, um, 
manually, you know, because it was sitting on the pallet. And then I had to drive slowly, drive the trailer away out from underneath it. And then I had this giant piece of equipment sitting in our garage. And I'm like, great. Now, what? Oh my God, what have I done? Right. So <laughs> I spent some time getting the machine to work and, and then, um, finding out, oh, okay, this thing does work. Uh, it looks like it can, you know, pick parts. And I spent a whole bunch of time tuning it and getting it to work. And then I realized, oh, crap, we need to get a whole bunch of other stuff. Like uh, we need a, a, a reflow solder machine. So after the boards are assembled, you know, you have to, you have to heat the boards up so the, the solder melts. So that's part of the electronics. You, you, you put the parts on the board, then you solder the boards, and then, and then you solder the bottom parts of the board after the top part top, top side of the board and we ended up um realizing that we needed a whole bunch of other equipment uh additional equipment to to like make to it all work because was the first one just one that like put the parts where they're supposed to be is that what that like what that machine yeah. did yeah it's a traditional like pick and place machine where it uses a vacuum nozzle where it picks the part off the reel and then puts it on the board and then just does that over and over again. Yep. Uh, and, uh, you know, when the, when the machine worked well, it was awesome. And then when, you know, when things went sideways, it went sideways at a high speed and just like <laughs> just wrecked everything. <laughs> right. Right. It's it, so, it, so there was a, a, often a lot of rework and a lot of uh, fixing and tuning and cursing. And yeah. So, um, what our garage looked like at one point was, um, you know, we had our, our pick and place machine. We had uh, reflow. We had like our, our 220 volt outlet, which is maxed out with, you know, solder machines, a solder machine that needed 60 amp circuit, another one that oh, needed Jesus, 30 yeah. amp circuit. And then we had on the, this is a, over, a slightly oversized two car garage. We had all of our equipment in one side and then we had our four post lift in the other side with two race cars stacked on top of each other. Okay. <laughs> so we were super cramped and we realized, wow, this thing is kind of taking off. And around that time we were kind of designing the next product, which was uh, race capture, the uh, data acquisition and telemetry system that we developed. And, um, but we realized, you know, we need, we need some commercial space. Uh, so we started researching commercial space and we finally found a place that was uh, about, it was, it's pretty nice. It's about eight minutes away from home in a uh, little industrial park. And uh, we moved every, we had this big moving weekend where everything moved over there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where we're at right now. Oh, so you've been there for a long time then, huh? Do you remember like what year? About, yeah, about eight years now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that wrong. Yeah, it's a, it's a great location. Um, there's no retail frontage because we don't need it, yeah. but um, it's kind of it's kind of tough because being in in suburbia, uh, where we are north of Seattle, there isn't a lot of uh, commercial space. A lot of it is retail retail property, so it's it's just a great fit for us. So then, what was the transition from going from both of you having jobs to neither one of you having other jobs, like? you know, just working for yourself. What, what was that transition like? That transition was like, um, Oh, when they came over from England in the ships, <laughs> yeah. the, uh, it was the, uh, burn the ships when you land. That's kind of, that's what the, at the inflection point where, when I quit my day job, um, that's what the sensation was. It's like, all right, burn the ships because, um, if you burn the ships, there's no going back. Yeah. Uh, but backing up a little bit, the, the leading up to that point, I was thinking, okay, what, what's another thing we could do besides Megajolt? Because it's a cool product, but it wasn't something you could really live off of. Um, that's kind of what we understood. So uh, we thought, okay, there's a whole bunch of things we could do in motorsports, all sorts of the different devices. And um, I thought, wow, you know, if we could create like an open system that's around collecting data from cars, wow, you, there's the world is wide open. There's so many different things you could do with that. It's just, it could be limitless, right? Mm -hmm. So that's when we developed the race capture system, which was just a, by itself, a, a, a data acquisition system that was open source. And we, I started developing that and I kind of sat on it for a couple of years. And um, 
a friend that I made in Boston, uh, Brian, he kind of poked me on Twitter and he says, hey, this is a cool project. Why don't you finish it? And I was like, ah, crap. <laughs> okay. Maybe I should. And, and he was, you know, uh, he says, I'd like to help you work on it. And uh, he's super awesome and uh, very, you know, very skilled engineer. And uh, we, we, were, we became really good friends. And we, he kind of got me to push it over the finish line. And it was kind of a, um, a formative a lesson for me that, um, you know, like if, if you've heard the term, the uh, perfect is the enemy of the good. Because if you're trying to make something perfect, it'll never fit. Yeah, never, you'll never, never get it, it done. Yep. Exactly. So um, that turned into our first crowdfunding um, experience okay. uh, on Indiegogo. So we launched race the fir first generation of Race Capture Pro on Indiegogo. And uh, just before we launched it, well, sometime before we launched it, we had um, – we had a race in, in Portland, Oregon, and I was I was looking at some uh, cellular technology, and I was researching that, and I was like, oh wow, I think maybe we could if we could take our race capture box, our data acquisition box, and connect a cellular module up to it, we could like broadcast some some interesting data, and and then uh, I was researching how Twitter works, and uh, we ended up making the world's first tweeting race car. So we made the car tweet autonomously uh based on what it was doing as if the car was tweeting like oh, cool. it had a personality yeah. yeah so um uh so whenever you would cry the car would cross start finish it would tweet and say oh scott got a you know uh, uh a, a two minute 10 good job oh he got the in and and, and beat the the team best right or mm -hmm. he and it would it would track you know high uh, top speed or you know, who is getting the fastest lap time or G-forces and things like that. So the, the car would just tweet periodically based on what was, uh, you know, what was happening. And then, of course, we could we could kind of control it behind the scenes like a puppet and like send it commands over SMS. So we were sending SMS commands up to Twitter, like text messages wow. uh, to Twitter to, to, to <laughs> yeah. get it to tweet. And uh, that was a lot of fun. And then we realized kind of slowly kind of dawned on us like, Oh, we could do affordable real-time telemetry for every racer mm. using this kind of technology, and then that that kind of segued into how we did our first crowdfunding campaign with the original version of Race Capture, and then an external box that added real-time telemetry. The telemetry. To that. Okay. And what year yeah. was that? That must have been fairly recent. 2013. Okay. Yeah. So about five years ago. So that's, yeah, that's really cool. And so how did the crowdfunding experience go? Was that, you know, did you, were you giving, I guess they do it in like tiers, you know, like subscription or not subscription, but donation tiers. Like, did you have one where they would get the box or get a card or like, how did you set that up? Yeah, that would, that's a great question. So we had studied a lot of the previous crowdfunding campaigns and just despite how much studying, and research you do, there's nothing like um, the experience of actually doing it yourself. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, we did set up uh, different um, tier levels and early bird uh, incentives, and um, we had uh, we had a, a tier where you just got the race capture system, and then a tier where you get the race capture plus the telemetry box add-on. And surprisingly, that was very popular. Um, it, it just, I, th I think it caught the imaginations of a, a lot of racers mm -hmm. and they kind of realized the potential for that and how it could, how they could use it to like improve their racing strategy in real time instead of after the fact. Uh, so that kind of surprised us, but, um, the, the whole crowdfunding, uh, the, the experience of doing a crowdfunding campaign is, is, is ex it's like an exciting and scary roller coaster. Yeah, because you're like um, watching and, it also in real time. You know, every time yeah. somebody donates more. So, did you make your goal? Uh, yeah, we. Uh, I think we. Yeah, we hit our goal by one, uh, one point five x. Okay. And um, which was great for the first, uh, for the first time effort, and uh, especially for kind of a niche. Uh, for, I mean, we weren't selling, you know, a, um, a cooler 
you know, or a 3D printer back then. So like yeah. something, <laughs> yeah. something that was just really f- focused on, um, on, on a, on a small the market, you know, market. Yeah. Speak, right. Motorsports market is smaller than, you know, like, uh, other consumer, uh, other consumer, um, yeah, uh, just products, like regular so. consumer products for everyday people. Exactly. So, uh, we were really, we were really thrilled with how that turned out and that, um, naturally helped fund our operations and our growth. <clears throat> we were still doing day jobs at that time. Um, so, uh, I would say the, like if, it, if, it, if anybody asks, like, should I do a crowdfunding campaign? It's like, the answer is like, yes and no at the same time. It's yes, it's, it's a great opportunity to create exposure for your company and your brand and to get the word out because it creates this sense of urgency. And also at the same time, there's some huge risks in terms of, you know, did you overestimate like how, f- how soon you could get something delivered or, um, you know, the pricing, getting the pricing right. There have been so many crowdfunding campaigns where they underpriced. Oh, yeah, the and then they can't make it. And they, yeah. they can't deliver. And then you kind of see the trajectory of the comments, right? Oh, and, yeah, and it goes south. Real, it's a best, real bad press very quickly. Yeah, it does. And uh, people and – it's, and it's understandable because, like, people sent you money in good faith, right? And money yeah. is hard to come by. <laughs> for were, your, were, your targets, were your targets pretty good? Were you able to manufacture the ones you needed and get them all sent out? I would, I would say as far as a f- relative to other crowdfunding campaigns, I think we did well uh, relative to our own benchmarks. We were, you know, we were late by a few months and, and had to defer some, some features, you know, to get, get things shipped uh, sooner. Uh, so we, I, I, internally, we, I wasn't, we weren't as satisfied as we would have liked to have been, but um, overall, we did ship a lot of things mostly on time, and it's super tough to to do that because because if you the the more complete a product is or whatever you're making, whatever you're crowdfunding, the higher the likelihood you're gonna you're gonna you're going to hit your target with the right quality. And with the features you promised, mm-hmm. so it's super tempting to, 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 to launch a crowdfunding campaign when things aren't ready yet, because you just like we just got to go, we got to do this, right? And but you have to wait and and get cl- the closer you can get to something that's shippable, the better. And that can that could be a really tough choice. So yeah, there there were some pros and cons. Although I would say. You know, we we didn't have any negative uh, posts on our, <laughs> <That's> on, <good>. our <laughs> on our crowdfunding campaign, which was kind of a um, you know like some questions like, so how's it going? You know, when are yeah. they shipping? Yeah, it's normal, but um, it wasn't like give me uh, my money back. You guys suck. Oh I'm my god, yeah, I'm gonna go that, buy something else. Been, we would have been crushed if we were in in a situation like that. So, yeah. um, uh, gratefully, we people knew who we were. And they knew that, you know, what, what we were up, the goals that we were up for. Yeah. You were, I mean, you were already making stuff that like that, you know, like you weren't, you, you were already an electronics company and you already racers and doing stuff. So yeah, I can, I, I can understand their understanding of you guys being a little tardy. That's not a big deal. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of the community, they, they knew us and we were a known quantity and, they they knew that we weren't going to, you know, take the money and run to Mexico or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Right, Man, so. that's really cool. Yeah, I've, I've never actually talked to anybody that did a crowdfunding. I've seen a lot of them, and, you know, I've never actually participated in one. But that's a cool experience that you guys leveraged that ability to raise funds from potential customers uh, to get your product launched. And I, I really enjoyed that, <laughs> kind of hearing how that worked and how you guys did. So congrats on making that happen. We were getting back on the idea of, uh, you know, quitting your day job. Um, right. Was there like an inflection point that you both were just like, okay, we're doing it. You know, did you just wake up one day and decide it? Or were you looking for like a revenue target of like, okay, we're now making $15,000 a month in revenue. We need to, you know, when we get to 16, we're going to do it. You know, what, what was the deciding factor there? It, would, it wasn't, it wasn't like a snap thing, but it was kind of like, um, it felt like it was welling up. Like you saw so it coming. Right. Like it, it felt like an, an inevitability. 
This kind of coincides with our, our second crowdfunding campaign. We've, we've had two so far. Oh, okay. The funny thing with um, when you do a crowdfunding campaign, there's the – there is the uh, oh wow that was cool wow I could have we could have done all those other things better and now and then and then you think well let's do another one how you know, after the, the <laughs> how pain of the first be? one yeah. <laughs> how much worse could it be right we could just do it that much better so we had a, a second crowdfunding campaign and uh, launching our our what we call race capture track which was a, a more affordable. Uh, version of our race capture system designed for track day enthusiasts and and autocrossers and and the the non not really the the pro racers but something that's just easy to kind of like a plug and play system. And at that time, we rebranded um, our telemetry platform to from race capture live to Podium, and we, we could talk about the reasons behind that uh, later. But um, the Right around that time, we were uh, we had built up our team, and um, basically a, a team of of other motorsport racers, and uh, also software engineers and hardware hardware people. Basically, people who were um, who were involved in motorsports, but also had the ability to you know program or had the skills to execute. Right, and okay. we were a virtual we were a virtual team, not in the same location. So. We we're around the country in California, uh, Madison, uh, New York, and Cal, and uh, another one in California. So um, we were uh, we were working on launching the second crowdfunding campaign, and you know the topic was around, wow, um, I need to do this full time, and we we're I was still doing our our. Uh, I was still doing my day job, and that was just getting harder and harder to kind of balance both because one was, one was, uh, you know, Autosport Labs was demanding more and more of my attention because yeah. of the, the, the potential, right? The, the inertia, just, just being, of me pushing and also getting pulled, right? At the same time, so it was creating a lot of conflict, like in me internally with with the day job, and there was uh, we just kind of. The uh, there was a point where we're like, okay, I think we're we're at a point with with revenue and and with this crowdfunding campaign where we we uh, we said uh, this is we kind of put down a date and mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah and uh, there was <laughs> I just I I said. You know, there was that conversation with my team and and like, OK, I'm doing it. All right. It's happening next week. All right. I'm giving notice. Holy crap. What did I just do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling it right now because it was it was kind of like jumping into into the deep end. It was kind of like, you know, taking that contract job back when I worked for my you know, back, way back when when I jumped off the deep end. It's just like doing it again. And you. You jump into the deep end, you start swimming, and uh, you know you have a plan, and you just start moving forward. And that has been over two years now. So yeah, burn the ships. Yeah, so you you you've taken the plunge, and you're not looking back, huh? Pretty much. That's awesome. So kind of shifting gears towards the more humbling negative side. Um, what has been something you know something that like a worst experience you've had in kind of making the transition or, you know, running the business yourself that maybe you didn't expect, um, you know, and it can be like, you know, payroll or cash flow or anything like that, you know, were there any kind of heartbreaks that you had in business? And then, you know, what did you do to overcome them? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. I would say that there's, um, a couple of them. Um, during our second crowdfunding campaign, um, we, we were in the middle of, we had just finished funding that campaign and then we were in the process of fulfilling, right? Like finishing up the software features for the new version of race capture that we, that we did in the, in the campaign and, and just like getting ready for production. And, um, around that time, um, uh, Kelly, our co-founder, her niece, uh, passed away from um, 
an opioid overdose, mm, okay. heroin overdose. And that just, that just pretty much destroyed us Yeah. for, it just, everything went sideways because she was very close to Renice and we had been working really hard with her to try to pull her out of, of the downward spiral that she was in. And for a lot of it, we were just kind of standing by the sidelines, just kind of like helpless. Like you can only do so much. And it was just, and then it, it, we kind of sensed that it was an inevitable thing. We didn't know how or when, but, you know, we were sitting at the, at the table on a, on a Sunday and like, everything's great. Monday's going to be like, we're going to, Monday will be cool. We're, you know, get to work on projects and we're having a nice Sunday evening. We get the call that she was in a hospital with an, with an overdose and then just everything went sideways there. Mm -hmm. Um, so that through our ability to execute on our crowdfunding campaign, uh, completely sideways because it just, it just, just like, yeah, it's um, like a morale destroyed killer. our lives. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and on top of that, and, and it was just, it's just staggering kind of to kind of think of it again. But, um, three months after that, Kelly lost her dad three months after her niece passed away. Yeah, it was like one, uh, one bad thing after another, huh? It was like two bad things within like two tr impossibly tragic things, one after the other, you know, within a three month time span. And that year was just you you don't want to ever experience something like that again mm -hmm. um her dad her dad uh died of a heart attack and i'm sure exacerbated by a broken heart from losing uh kelly's niece because her dad was there also trying to save her and that just crushed him mm. and a lot of times you know when things happen in in a family they kind of go and and, and there's like a wave of it, right? Like somebody passes away and then the, another person passes away due to the shock of that experience. And that just, we were just destroyed for, for several months, uh, a year really. Um, yet at the same time, we had to continue working on, on our crowdfunding campaign and, and, and fulfill uh, obligations. We, we provided an update saying, um, this thing happened. It really sucks. We're really sorry. And, uh, we were working to, to, to uh, fulfill on, on the product as, uh, as best possible. Yeah. Yeah. Be so, a little patient with this as we get through this time and then we'll get back to yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. They, the kickstart. So the second one was on Kickstarter and Kickstarter has you fill out a section that says, what are some of the risks and challenges with your product? Like your project, what could happen that could delay your product. And of course, you knew you were like, Oh, you know, like, it'd be like, like part shortages or like, Oh, we designed something wrong and we have to rework it or, you know, all those likely. Yeah. The typical things. things we yeah. Didn't, we didn't like say like, yeah, with two of our closest family members could like die. Right. And like, how do you, you can't plan. You're for not going to plan for that. No, no, there's nothing you, you can't can plan do. For that. Right. So that, that's just, that was really, that was a really tough, dark period for us. Um, so that one was, um, that was, that was a real tough one. The other, the other, um, the other experience, and this was kind of a learning experience for us was that, um, we were approached by a very, a very, uh, a large motorsports concern about they were interested in our products and they wanted to potentially, you know, do rebranding and, and, uh, possibly funding. And we got led down a path that ended up in a dead end, uh, for several months. Basically mm. we were, we were teased and, and I, I have to speak kind of obliquely, uh, due to, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, privacy, due to privacy yeah. concerns, <laughs> but like we were, <laughs> we were, we were pulled down a path of like, wow, there's going to be some amazing things happening if, you know, if this deal works out and we were wined and dined and then it just ended and there was nothing. And we were, we were left holding a pretty big bill for 
a lot of the analysis work we had to do in terms of like what the business would look like if we got a huge amount of funding and everything. And, and I think that was an experience where we were, we, we, we could have been a little more, what's the word? Like you have to have healthy skepticism, right? Yeah. A little more cautious with that one, huh? Yeah. It's like, you don't, you don't want to be, you don't want to be so cautious that you preclude any, any opportunity for, you know, whatever happening, like opportunities that come by, you don't want to just discount them out of hand, but you have to look at everything very cautiously, soberly. Uh, if that's not a very good word either, but <laughs> the, yeah. you, you have to, you have to look at things realistically, Yeah, every opportunity realistically. And, um, that, uh, that has trained us plus other things when things get spun up, like, oh my God, this is going to be amazing, you know, and then it doesn't pan out. You kind of get to the point and this, this will happen in every business because, you know, you'll have somebody saying, yeah, can you quote me a thousand of these just to kind of get you excited to, to do a business engagement. And you really have to be very mature and, and, um, aware of, of like the, nothing is real until the money hits the bank. <laughs> yes. Uh, right. Yeah, that, I mean, that just happened to us actually like twice this year already with anticipated yeah. big franchise deals for our project management software at a couple facilities. And we got all, you know, got all spun up about it. And then they're like, oh yeah, we can't do it. Or, or they just went dark and it's like, oh Jesus, <laughs> like all this time right. and effort and putting this stuff together. And they weren't even like really, they were just like kicking tires kind of stuff. They weren't very serious about it. So yeah, it can be very disheartening yeah. if, you know, you, you don't, you just kind of walk into it blindly and don't ask a couple basic questions before you get started to kind of clear up, you know, the real reasoning behind the, the request. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that is a, that is a, probably one of the biggest uh, bits of wisdom uh, for like a new business is, is be careful about getting, uh, getting spun up on potential opportunities mm -hmm. because they, they could, it could take you out. It really could. Like if, especially if it causes you to cancel your, your, um, or cancel or pause your business plans or product launches or strategy or takes you sideways that, that could, um, that could be really damaging. So that was a, a, a big lesson for us. What's something you guys are doing right now that's got you really fired up? We are working on um, building our uh, building the podium platform. So uh, backing up the the uh, race capture with its telemetry. Mm -hmm. We used to we we had a pl our platform was called our website uh, was called Race Capture Live, and uh, we were we were exhibiting at the at the PRI show, and we were showing our stuff. We're really excited and proud about it. Lots of lots of interest. And we kind of got this, we got this continuous feedback of, wow, your stuff is really cool, but I already have a data system. Yep, so yeah. if I buy your, if I buy your box, it's going to be like, I have two different systems in my car. Yeah. So, um, uh, Kelly, our, our co-founder said, uh, you know, we really need, uh, to be able to just do telemetry for existing systems. Uh, and we're like, yeah, that, that really makes sense. And, and, um, we kind of, we, we, we kind of circled on this for quite a while. Um, it was always that, that, okay, we need to get around to that, but we're also building kind of the, the, the underpinnings and the, and the infrastructure to be able to do that with all the features mm -hmm. in the main race capture system. So we, um, we had, we had prepared, um, the launch of of Podium Connect, which is our our box that is a telemetry bridge for existing systems, we had prepared for that by renaming our website uh, from Race Capture Live to Podium. So Podium is is a a platform where people can live stream their racing, uh, their telemetry data, do um, analysis in real time, uh, share with their friends. Uh, get race coaches to, to uh, remotely be able to watch, uh, the motorsports race car data and do uh, real time coaching remotely or live, uh, from the, from the pits, share with your friends, everything. But when we, 
that whole world. Basically, it's kind of like the imagine the F1 app and like Strava or uh, Map My Fitness, like mm -hmm. those uh, athlete tracking programs. Kind of think of the those two mashed together into into one world. So kind of like an athlete tracking program, race car the data race tracking cars. program. <laughs> Same difference. But you, <laughs> right, and then, but just a lot more sensors on a race car. Yep. Right. <laughs> then on your yeah, typical it can have athlete, a whole bunch a more, lot yeah. more. Right. And then the the fan engagement part of the F1 app because motorsports has fans, right? Mm -hmm. So we create so the podium the pod, race capture live was renamed to podium set the stage for the launch of what we call podium connect podium connect is a small box whose sole purpose is to add telemetry to an existing aim motec race technology aem uh, a, a race logic v box or any other data system super cool so if they've already got a dash and a in an ECU, they just can use your box to transmit the data back to the pits or to anybody. Exactly. Yep. And um, so it's marketed as a telemetry add-on for your existing investment, rather than a a like a, um, a like the race capture, which is to, like two different systems, yep. right? So, but the of course it's based on race capture technology. You know, they say engineers are inherently lazy. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. So it's based on race capture technology, just trimmed down with the, the cellular modem, the uh, the ability to connect up uh, two, two different CAN buses and a serial uh, RS-232 input. So it's super flexible in terms of how it can uh, integrate with other systems. And uh, so a lot of the work that we put in the race capture went into the ability to create Podium Connect. Wow. That's so super cool. Yeah. That, I'm excited to kind of see that. I haven't seen one of those in person, but I'm looking forward to working with some teams that are going to be using some of that stuff. And I think that's really cool technology for sure. Yeah. Thank you. And the, um, the, the thing that, uh, we are launching soon is, uh, a complement to our web interface, but we're, we are launching uh, a dedicated app for podium and that going back to the, the uh, F1 app meets, you know, Strava or Map My Fitness. You'll be able to in your hand, because uh, right now you use a web browser to look at the podium uh -huh. data. So people will use a laptop, for example, in the pits uh, to to watch uh, what's going on on with their race car and podium. Um, what you'll be able to do, so I'll paint the picture here. You will have in your hand, on your phone, or on your tablet, or even on your laptop, the ability to run the podium app where in your hand you could be at turn one watching the telemetry data from the car or you could be in the bar with your friends after the race and then comparing your laps oh, yep. and your yep. data together against you know doing the bench racing right or you could put it on a bigger screen in the pits and with a, a touch screen interface you'll be able to it'd be like um a futuristic movie where you'll be able to <laughs> i forgot what the oh minority report is a classic yeah. right right where they're using their hands and like manipulating the data around, so yeah. everything's like yeah touch screen oriented uh being able to <laughs> it's just making it very accessible it. like wherever you want to look at it and give you a lot of freedom to to mess with it huh exactly so so we will have uh, a full experience in an app form for for Podium and also bringing in uh, some of the social features we've been waiting to uh, to um, add, like uh, following other racers mm -hmm. and comparing lap easily and fluidly comparing uh, data between racers and and teams and just the whole world around around being able to share easily uh, the motorsports experience and also between fans and team members and race coaches. Awesome. Awesome. Well, on that cool announcement, uh, let's uh, pause real quick for a break, and then we'll be right back. We all know owning a shop is difficult, so we created My Shop Assist to help you manage the various jobs. Whether you run a machine shop, a performance tuning shop, build off-road trucks, or even do powder coating, My Shop Assist can help you. It is completely online and will help you schedule the jobs, log time on each task, track parts orders, and take pictures of the work. You can even export your jobs from My Shop Assist into QuickBooks as invoices. So if you're interested to improve operations at your shop, check out myshopassist.com to start your 30-day free trial. 
So we're back with uh, Brent Picasso of Auto Sport Labs, and I wanted to get kind of the sense of the business itself. You know, so you you t you said that you guys have moved into a new facility and you're still in it. So kind of tell us, you know, how big is the place? Do you rent it? You know, how many people do you have now? You know, other than just you and your wife, you know, just kind of walk us through the business itself. Yeah, we after after we moved out of our garage, we uh, we went into our our commercial space, and we're about uh, right now we're about 1,300 square feet, and part of it is uh, split between uh, electronics manufacturing uh, with our, our uh, pick and place machines, solder machines on on one side, you know what we call our clean area, so to speak. Uh, we have our milling machine. And uh, a laser laser cutter that we're building, and on the other side we have um, we have our, our area where we're building our race cars. Uh, we have an exoset, uh, exomotive exoset that we're building uh, based off of a, a Miata chassis mm -hmm. that we used to endurance race, as well as uh, a couple of other race cars. And um, yeah, we've been there for several years, and it's a really good space. That's that's working out for us. Uh, we're two full-time people right now, and we have three three part-time uh, working on the working on Auto Sport Labs. And um, most of the team is virtual, so we don't really have an office space where we get together uh, formally. But uh, we we collaborate uh, over uh, Slack, uh, okay, yep. primarily. And um, a lot of the work that we do is software-oriented. So we have um, we use a lot of a lot of tools for for collaboration, uh, GitHub for our software management and Slack uh, for team communications and uh, Google Hangouts, which is a big one for us. Um, yeah, so that that is kind of that that kind of paints the picture for for the Autosport Labs organization. What was cool about about our uh, especially cool about our team is that we we picked people who were right, the right fit for the team not people who are convenient so everybody is uh into motorsports uh -huh. like, yeah uh, they, get they it. also have the <laughs> right they also have the ability to um work in their respective domains like write software design hardware or whatever it might be so that's that's really cool because you know in a lot of larger organizations you have to you know the product what they call a product manager who is designing the product has to explain to the engineer what is being built and why that that whole part is just short circuited for us because we know exactly what needs to be done and why awesome so what's your like what what's like a day in your life you know when when you get up where do you what do you normally do at the business <laughs> that's good um the pattern so my i i would say a successful day is um if if i Everything kind of goes to plan based on what I imagined myself doing for that day, you know, based yeah. on, <laughs> yeah. on, on, the, on the planning from last night. Like, okay, tomorrow I'm going to uh, I'm going to uh, address some support questions, write some documentation, uh, go to our lab, um, deal with some production, and then come back and write some, you know, like fix a bug. And if that if that if I can kind of go according to plan. Then that's that's a pretty great day. Mm -hmm. But so yeah, waking up, uh, you know, trying to wake <laughs> while I'm trying to wake up, check check my emails, see see what has happened. Nothing blew up. Okay, cool. You know, <laughs> then <laughs> take care of some communications and then try to get some uh, get some work done. Uh, however, I have planned it. Uh, there's a there's a saying that um, you know, are you working on your business or in your business? And that's really important because when you're working on your business, you're working to improve it or to to kind of take it to the next level. You're you're doing strategy, mm -hmm. right? When you're working in your business, you're just you're turning the crank. That's all you're doing. You're yeah. just you're you're doing production or you're you're just going through motions that are necessary. So um, I try to work. I try to work on the business as much as possible, you know, and as our, and as our production volumes go up, we will need to do things like go to uh, contract manufacturing uh, for the higher volume uh, products that we have, like Podium Connect, uh, especially. And um, then uh, that will free us up to work on the business, right? And yep. then um, another thing for us 
it, that's kind of getting in our in our production uh, in our way uh, right now is uh, my day to day work uh, and our team's day to day work is dealing with uh, orders. Right, we have our own we have our own web store right now, and we also have this growing uh, dealer network. And uh, we're at this uh, point now where we are going to go soon to dealer only sales. Okay. And that's kind of like a big, scary, another one of those, right? Kind of going <laughs> yeah. off the theme of those big, scary transitions, but you just jump into the deep end and just do it. But in order to, for us to scale internally and also for, for us to support our dealers, we need to go to dealer only sales. And um, and that is another another big uh, transition for us that will be happening this year. So we are we almost have a complete uh, dealer network worldwide. Uh, we're bringing uh, Australia and um, even South Africa online. And once we have that, then we will be able to sell to any any part of the world uh, and safely, if I call it that, yeah. safely turn off our. Uh, our online store and then just focus on dealers, which I think they will appreciate quite a bit and they, they deserve it. Yeah, definitely. That, uh, that kind of generated a couple questions that I wanted to ask. So, you know, just in doing my pre-interview research, it looked like you guys are manufacturing everything in house, like your, your boards, your soldering, your, you know, all these machines you've got, your, yep. is that correct? You were doing like all of it in your little shop. And that was just, it, it's interesting to hear that because we had, uh, we had a guest on a few weeks ago, uh, John Nguyen of Trackspec Motorsports. And he, from the very beginning was the exact opposite. He's like, I don't want to do anything. I want to, you know, I want to advertise the product and ship it out, <laughs> you know, like that and yeah. design it. He didn't want to manufacture it. He didn't want to, you know, powder coat it like none of that. So you guys, you know, started off going down a different path of having full control over all that. And so it sounded like that was working, but now you mentioned that you're going to having somebody else manufacturing it for scale purposes. So um, yeah. are, are you going to keep everything for like R and D and small projects, or are you looking to kind of really just become a design and fulfillment company? Good question. So yeah, the, the plan the uh, kind of the organic, if you call it that um, plan is to, as as products ramp up, uh, we will carve that off to okay. contract manufacturing, and then save the existing equipment for R and D. And we might get to the point where we're like, "Wow, this stuff is just kind of collecting dust, right? Mm -hmm. We don't really need it, need it anymore." So uh, that could be a, it. Could be uh, in the future we just may not need it anymore and just get rid of it, or you know we could save it for R and D purposes or something small volume or or um or anything like that the yep. the power of you know we're kind of control freaks so that kind of it fits our um it fits our mo to be able to have that just in time manufacturing agility yeah and also the, <laughs> right and then like like with the contract manufacturing minimums um that that yeah. exists it's it's easy to spin up something and once you've uh, already proven it idea. yeah yeah right you spin up an idea, you can you can do it in low volume very very inexpensively to try out an idea and then you could like dump it if it's not if it's not important, right? Yeah. With, instead of instead of like placing a big bet on on one thing and holy crap it better be the it better work. Yeah. Right? Because we've otherwise you're just going to have a lot of widgets sitting on the shelf and <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, and then so, the, the next one was like, you know, what it, switching over to the dealer network, you know, so you started out as a consumer facing website where they can buy now your products. And so that's yeah. going to be a pretty big switch. Are you going to be, you know, just do you already have kind of a network of shops that you've met over the years and, you know, to help promote your product? And are you still going to be doing a lot of, you know, heavy promotion yourself to, you know, direct people to those dealers? Absolutely, yeah. We do have a um, a great network of dealers worldwide, and we've been working on on building that for a number of years. So okay. now, so it's you kind of have of, both at the same yeah. time, and you're just canceling the consumer side to focus in on the dealers. Yeah, we will certainly be promoting our products mm -hmm. just as much as <laughs> as we were before, but um, it will be like available through you know. 
available from our dealers worldwide. Yep. That'll be that'll be the emphasis. And so it and sounds will, like you're looking yeah. to do individual dealers or are you in talks with, you know, the big box uh, wholesale distributors as well? Uh, primarily, we've been uh, individual dealers because they're very; those type of dealers are very close to mm -hmm. uh, their customer, the customer base, especially with the um, like the endurance racing and road racing that we are working with. Um, uh, a big box a retailer, some somebody we would certainly um, uh, we would talk to, and we certainly we do have one right now. One of our dealers is Pelican Parts. I would say mm -hmm. that they're pretty big. Yep. Yeah, I was yeah. thinking like you know a Turn 14 or a Motivicity or something like that to buying lots of quantity, but then them shipping it out. So it does carve into your profitability, but um, just lessens a lot of the logistics side of it. It does. And it just helps everybody scale better. So yep. yeah, we would certainly, yeah, we would certainly approach that as well. Cool. So what's the, you don't have to give me like actual revenue numbers, but what's kind of maybe the percentage breakdown? Well, you can give me revenue numbers if you want, but what's like the percentage breakdown of the different things that you guys sell? So it sounds like you have lots of products and I've looked through your website and you have, you know, sensors and everything too. So kind of break that down into genres and, you know, what, how does it all pan out? It is, uh, I would say that, um, the, the dominant products that we have are is race capture and podium, and then I would say that mega, then the funny ironically the the mega jolt is has been ticking along, okay. and we just we just did a we did a, a pre order for uh, a, an updated version of the mega jolt system, and um, primarily to it's kind of funny you know we we did it to improve a number of features, just a lot of uh, a lot of niggling problems and manufacturability issues and and just just things that we we wanted to do for a long time and it's basically the same unit just just refined okay. right so we did we did pre-orders on that and uh that is a you know it has a surprising uh surprising popularity <laughs> but okay well because mega score just right? rebranded i mean they've rebranded as ms whatever now so like those yep. companies are still going strong, so no reason you can't do the same thing with yours. Oh, absolutely! Like engine management is is huge. Our our focus is on race capture and podium, uh -huh. specifically on podium. So, um, race capture and podium connect uh, dominate dominate our our sales naturally, and then um, the accessories that we sell are, are secondary. But as you can as you can probably figure out. So that is that is primarily what our uh, what our revenue focus is on right now. Are you yeah. are you looking to are, are you going to keep offering all the products that you have, or are you going to kind of narrow it down? Because we were just having this conversation on the like the do it for a living community of shop owners, and it was just you know you you can blow up the number of SKUs you got, but if you know three things make ninety percent of your profit, why not just build those? You know, and we even had a guest of. Uh, yeah. Futura trailers, uh, that was several months ago, but he said he, they were making like 50 something different trailers and now they make three, you know, and life is just a whole lot better. So is that something you guys have considered or is it still like, might as well just make anything and everything that people need and want? There's a lot of wisdom in that sentiment and we're, we're moving in that, uh, direction as well. So, um, what we'll be doing is, uh, when we transition to dealer only sales, we will be condensing a lot of our individual items, especially mm -hmm. sensors, uh, into kits. Okay. So that like, just here's a kit that has, you know, two temperature sensors, a pressure sensor, and then a couple of accessories into a bundled kit mm. that we could sell as a, as a single SKU. Yeah. Much uh, easier. Yeah. We, what we, what we're, what we'll be wanting from, from our, our dealer network is to like when we shut off our online store, we want to make sure that our customers, when they look at our list of dealers, is that they have a frustration-free way of <laughs> yeah. buying. Yeah. Right. Like, I need to buy a race capture with these accessories, and they click on one of the dealers. They need to be able to do that easily, or they'll give up. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we'll be uh, working with our dealers to make sure that their our customers' buying experience from them is at least as good as what we had okay. ourselves. So. And on the flip side, we want to make we don't want to overwhelm our dealers with a huge number of SKUs. Yeah. So we'll be condensing our SKUs down, um, making them you know pretty sane, and then um, you know dropping other products that just don't fit anymore um, wow. yep. for 
uh, for what we're doing. And <laughs> also, <makes> sense. <laughs> yeah, like uh, like with the your your thought your what you were saying about the 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 trailer company. Um, you know, there are a lot of products, a lot of ideas that that we could execute very well on. Like we have the technical expertise to do, but just doesn't fit our business model. And um, you have to be really careful not to sh chase the the, the, the shiny object. <laughs> yep. That's that's a real tough one, but um, getting better at that. So what about like advertising? It sounds like the those crowdfundings were probably a pretty good source of advertising for you. What what have you found to be the best way to spread the word about your products? Is it, I mean, in my head, it's just, it would be going to races and showing people, but you know, what, what have you found works best? Going to races is very powerful. Um, it's, it's a, um, it is also a, a tremendous time commitment and cost commitment for travel mm -hmm. and it interrupts it. Basically you, you're, you know, you're sending your core people there, right. And it, everything stops yep. from the point that you start preparing for the race to when you you're at the race and then recovering after that, uh, it is an interruption in, in your work. And, and at the same time on the heels of coming coming back from that event, you realize, wow, that was really powerful. We should do more of those. Yeah. So it's, there's kind of a double edged sword there. Um, the, uh, the other, uh, the, what else we found is, uh, advertising on Facebook helps. Um, the, I would say that, um, you have to know where your audience congregates. In, in a long ago, and it still applies now, enthusiasts are in forums. We're in forums. Okay. So um, customers will share about your product in the forums and you kind of, kind of, you can find those and kind of be like, you can, you can go in there and con contribute, say, Hey, thanks for mentioning. Let us know if you have any questions without being spammy about it. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very careful. That's, so that's kind of like integrating into a community is a good way of kind of doing advertising that only costs your time, right? Um, aside from that, aver like raw advertising, Facebook is really good at that because um, a lot of a lot of people in motorsports are on Facebook yep. compared to like Twitter. So Twitter is kind of a wasteland as far as yeah. It sounds like you as, you started off in that realm, but you know that one to me doesn't make very much sense. Uh, yeah, we don't get a lot of traction on Twitter just because it doesn't seem to be a, an environment where there's a lot of, a lot of yeah, it's um, not really commerce. Activity. Yeah, it's not commerce. Driven. I'm talking about. Right. So, uh, Facebook is, is a good, good area. Um, our Autosport labs community is a great way for, um, we have a, we have our page, but also the community that, that is linked to the page. And mm -hmm. that's a great, great way for people to share ideas or ask questions or ask for help and, um, whatever we post there, is always something that contributes to like you, if you have an existing system hey we posted a how to on you know oh, connecting yeah. a connecting a race technology system the podium connect here's some ideas rather than just you know spamming them for advertising <laughs> yeah. we, we wouldn't do you know that's for the main page right the community facebook page thing is pretty cool for businesses yeah you know, because it, it gets the people that are fans and it, and then they get alerts about it. So it essentially turns the original Facebook business page into the new Facebook business page of the community. Uh, it, it is. Yeah. And you have to craft it carefully. So it's a contribution to them rather than, than like then I said, spam. than yeah. spamming them. But um, yeah, the regular uh, Facebook's algorithms are changing such that um, pages aren't. Oh yeah. Almost none. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like there's hardly any traction people hardly ever see. You have to promote everything to get to get um, visibility yeah. into people who like and follow Which, your I mean, page. It's, so it's, it's like, like, we all like to gripe about it, but it's advertising, you know, like it, we, it we is, got it for yeah. free for so long, we got spoiled and now we have to pay for it again. Everybody gets their panties in a wad, but it's like, yep. it's just advertising. Yeah. You know, you, everybody used to sponsor the forums and now they don't. And so, you know, spending a couple hundred bucks a month on <laughs> Facebook is the same thing uh, as spreading it over the forum. So yeah, it, it's, yeah. it's a nature of the beast, but I think it, you know, it makes sense for most people. Um, so what is like, what's like the one year plan for the business? What do you guys want to do or see yourself this time next year? Our one year plan for the business is, is to grow the podium platform, uh, and, uh, just fulfill on, on 
what we have set out with the uh, with the Podium Connect launch that we did earlier this year, and to just grow that out and to launch the Podium app and to just continue continue refining our focus on building that world for motorsport enthusiasts. Nice. nice. Yeah. And so, what about like a five year plan? What's the big, hairy, audacious goal? Uh, expanding staff in our facility and um, further growth of of the platform. I would say that that is the and ends like some major partnerships is awesome. our is our goal. Yeah, those yeah. would be good. So what about yeah. <laughs> um, our listeners like to take action on do it for a living. So can you suggest an action item that they can do this week maybe to improve their situation? I would say limit your focus on what you're doing and focus on a core expertise. And uh, even if it's narrower, a narrower customer base, work on making them delighted and then grow that out. Like limit how much, how many things you're chasing after, mm -hmm. how many different things you're chasing after. Yeah, there could be a, lo a lot said in specializing. Right. And, um, and that is something you could do in a week. You could choose, you know what, we're going to cancel that project mm -hmm. or we're not going to pursue that opportunity. It looks like an opportunity, but it's going to throw us sideways in our business. Just go. It feels so good to say no to things. Sometimes, <laughs> yeah. it really does. I it's agree like, with you. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Like we we uh, we, there, we were presented with a, an opportunity to work on a project that was totally in our domain that we could have done. I mean, in our expertise, right? Yeah, and, just and didn't also have the in bandwidth. A, it didn't make sense. Yeah. Uh, for our business uh, business plan, and if we were to to take it on, we would have been sucked in, and uh, everything else would have stopped. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, be be. It's such a relief to say no to something, so you can focus on your on what your core is. Um, you know, like like um, it's possible that we could make a whole lot more money doing other things. Maybe like. You know, uh, we've sold a number of our race capture systems into um, like industrial telemetry, right? Mm -hmm. Like we have we have uh, some of our race capture systems running on, of all things, uh, a mining uh, mining rig oh, yeah. in yep. in Western Australia. <laughs> yeah, right. Like they it makes sense. Like, we yeah, need... we need to know what the machines are doing. Okay, here you go. Right, and uh, there have been some cases where, like, wow, we could. Uh, we could just go straight, you know, straight into industrial telemetry. Maybe that'll make us more money, but we're passionate about motorsports mm -hmm. first. And we want to make this, make this real. Yeah. You're not done um, with this one yet. <laughs> yeah. So, and it, you know, it's like, and also we're, we're kind of like, if you watch the video of our second crowdfunding campaign, it's kind of funny, but you know, there've been uh, around that time, there were a lot of apps around uh, like tracking your teenagers to make sure um, oh yeah, they weren't speeding uh, or doing other that they're stuff. They're not yeah. speeding, or they're you know they're geofencing and and you know responsible driving and fuel efficient driving and and in our in our crowd, crowd at the beginning of our crowdfunding video, we're like, we're not doing these. We're not we're not tracking your kids or like we said, fuck that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. Basically, you know, our our platform is about like you're not driving fast enough, you're not burning enough gas, yeah, or maybe the you other way. burn less <laughs> gas or go faster. Yeah. You know, ours is about ours is about motorsports and you know, and just that. Yeah. So. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I've got kind of one little fun question here at the end that I always like to ask people, and uh, it's what is your like daily driver like? typical vehicle that you take for your eight minute commute to get into the shop with like the not a race car i had it's it's an exercise in deferred gratification and i'll explain why because i've had an e30 four door five speed e36 m3 oh, for like man. forever i just bought and one of those and i absolutely love it <laughs> it's a great that the thing is is it's a great car yeah it's had it's it's it, it's been a problem child for a long time, but yeah, I kind of yeah. fixed everything on it. <laughs> and you know, the heater core only blew up on my f on my feet and flip flops a couple of times. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> you know, you know, not too bad. You know, it's only left me stranded on a freeway once. You know, with the with the uh, the tank, the the hoses on the um, the plastic fittings on the radiator, and and uh, the head gasket only blew once. But I kind of exaggerate. It's actually been really reliable. It's a great car, and like I do, like the next car I want is the V8 M3. But 
I, 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 we have to get to a certain part in the business. That'll be your present, huh? Yeah. That'll be my gift. So yeah. like, that's the joke about deferred gratification, <laughs> which I seem to be very good at. So. Well, you know, just to close out, um, if people are interested to find out more your company, where can they go online to kind of get more information? Yeah, if you want to learn about Podium, uh, the Podium platform, go to uh, point your web browser to podium.live. And if you want to look at uh, the... Uh, the race capture systems, just go to autosportlabs.com. And uh, if you're interested in buying, definitely look at our dealer list uh, worldwide. And uh, we are welcoming uh, dealers, uh, additional dealers uh, anywhere in the world. So definitely uh, send us an email at sales at autosportlabs.com and we would love to talk to you. That's awesome, man. Yeah, I'm really excited to see, you know, the the future products you have coming out and get some experience with the ones that you've already got on the market. So really appreciate you taking some time to talk with us today on the podcast and uh, wish you the best of luck moving forward. This was a ton of fun. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Do It For A Living. You can find out more about this guest, this show, and even details about what we just talked about at our website, Check out the Facebook page at facebook.com slash do it for a living and tell us who you want to hear from. And most importantly, subscribe to the podcast. Click subscribe. Do it now. Seriously. I'll wait while you grab your phone. Open up the podcast app. Tap the subscribe button. When you subscribe, you help us gain momentum and attract more high-level guests. Thanks for listening and good luck.